Hello, and welcome to Family Folktales from the Nashville Public Library. I'm Susan Poulter, a librarian at the Main Library. Today's stories are the story of the envious man and of him who was envied, and the story of the third dervish, son of a king. This is part four of our stories from the Arabian Nights Entertainments, selected and edited by Andrew Lang. We begin by continuing the story of the second dervish and a story he told. The Story of the Envious Man and of Him Who Was Envied In a town of moderate size, two men lived in neighboring houses, but they had not been there very long before one man took such a hatred of the other and envied him so bitterly that the poor man determined to find another home, hoping that when they no longer met every day, his enemy would forget all about him. So he sold his house and the little furniture it contained and moved into the capital of the country, which was luckily at no great distance. About half a mile from this city, he bought a nice little place with a large garden and a fair-sized court in the center of which stood an old well. In order to live a quieter life, the good man put on the robe of a dervish and divided his house into a quantity of small cells where he soon established a number of other dervishes. The fame of his virtue gradually spread abroad, and many people, including several of the highest quality, came to visit him and ask his prayers. Of course, it was not long before his reputation reached the ears of the man who envied him, and this wicked wretch resolved never to rest till he had in some way worked ill to the dervish whom he hated. So he left his house and his business to look after themselves, and betook himself to the new dervish monastery, where he was welcomed by the founder with all the warmth imaginable. The excuse he gave for his appearance was that he had come to consult the chief of the dervishes on a private matter of great importance. "'What I have to say must not be overheard,' he whispered. "'Command, I beg of you, that your dervishes retire into their cells, as night is approaching, and meet me in the court.' The dervish did as he was asked without delay, and directly they were alone, the envious man began to tell a long story, edging as they walked to and fro, always nearer to the well, and when they were quite close— he seized the dervish and dropped him in. He then ran off triumphantly, without having been seen by anyone, and congratulating himself that the object of his hatred was dead and would trouble him no more. But in this he was mistaken. The old well had long been inhabited, unknown to mere human beings, by a set of fairies and genies, who caught the dervish as he fell, so that he received no hurt. The dervish himself could see nothing, but he took for granted that something strange had happened, or he must certainly have been dashed against the side of the well and been killed. He lay quite still, and in a moment he heard a voice saying, Can you guess whom this man is that we have saved from death? No, replied several other voices, and the first speaker answered, I will tell you. This man, from pure goodness of heart, forsook the town where he lived and came to dwell here, in the hope of curing one of his neighbors of the envy he felt towards him. But his character soon won him the esteem of all, and the envious man's hatred grew, till he came here with the deliberate intention of causing his death. And this he would have done without our help, the very day before the sultan has arranged to visit this holy dervish and to entreat his prayers for the princess, his daughter. "'But what is the matter with the princess that she needs the dervish's prayers?' asked another voice. "'She has fallen into the power of the genie Maimum, 
"'The son of Dimdim,' replied the first voice. "'But it would be quite simple for this holy chief of the dervishes to cure her, if he only knew. "'In his convent there is a black cat, which has a tiny white tip to its tail. "'Now, to cure the princess, the dervish must pull out seven of those white hairs, "'burn them, and with their smoke perfume the head of the princess.' This will deliver her so completely that Maimum, the son of Dimdim, will never dare to approach her again. The fairies and genies ceased talking, but the dervish did not forget a word of all they had said. And when morning came, he perceived a place in the side of the well which was broken and where he could easily climb out. The dervishes, who could not imagine what had become of him, were enchanted at his reappearance. He told them of the attempt on his life made by his guest of the previous day, and then retired into his cell. He was soon joined here by the black cat, of which the voice had spoken, who came as usual to say good morning to his master. He took him on his knee, and seized the opportunity to pull seven white hairs out of his tail, and put them on one side till they were needed. The sun had not long risen before the sultan, who was anxious to leave nothing undone that might deliver the princess, arrived with a large suite at the gate of the monastery, and was received by the dervishes with profound respect. The sultan lost no time in declaring the object of his visit, and leading the chief of the dervishes aside, he said to him, "'Noble sheik, you have guessed, perhaps, what I have come to ask you.' "'Yes, sire,' answered the dervish. "'If I am not mistaken, it is the illness of the princess "'which has procured me this honor. "'You are right,' returned the sultan, "'and you will give me fresh life "'if you can, by your prayers, "'deliver my daughter from the strange malady "'that has taken possession of her. "'Let your highness command her to come here, "'and I will see what I can do.' The sultan, full of hope, sent orders at once that the princess was to set out as soon as possible, accompanied by her usual staff of attendants. When she arrived, she was so thickly veiled that the dervish could not see her face, but he desired a brazier to be held over her head, and laid the seven hairs on the burning coals. The instant they were consumed, terrific cries were heard, but no one could tell from whom they proceeded. Only the dervish guessed that they were uttered by Maimum, the son of Dimdim, who felt the princess escaping him. All this time she had seemed unconscious of what she was doing, but now she raised her hand to her veil and uncovered her face. "'Where am I?' she said in a bewildered manner, "'and how did I get here?' The sultan was so delighted to hear these words that he not only embraced his daughter, but kissed the hand of the dervish. Then, turning to his attendants who stood round, he said to them, "'What reward shall I give to the man who has restored me my daughter?' They all replied with one accord that he deserved the hand of the princess. "'That is my own opinion,' said he and from this moment I declare him to be my son-in-law. Shortly after these events, the Grand Vizier died, and his post was given to the dervish. But he did not hold it for long, for the sultan fell victim to an attack of illness, and as he had no sons, the soldiers and priests declared the dervish heir to the throne, to the great joy of all the people. One day when the dervish, who had now become sultan, was making a royal progress with his court, he perceived the envious man standing in the crowd. He made a sign to one of his viziers, and whispered in his ear, "'Fetch me that man who is standing out there, but take great care not to frighten him.' The vizier obeyed, and when the envious man was brought before the sultan, the monarch said to him, "'My friend,' I am delighted to see you again. Then, turning to an officer, he added, Give him a thousand pieces of gold out of my treasury, 
and twenty wagon loads of merchandise out of my private stores, and let an escort of soldiers accompany him home. He then took leave of the envious man, and went on his way. Now, when I had ended my story, I proceeded to show the genie how to apply it to himself, said the second dervish. O oh, genie, I said, you see that this sultan was not content with merely forgiving the envious man for the attempt on his life. He heaped rewards and riches upon him. But the genie had made up his mind and could not be softened. Do not imagine that you were going to escape so easily, he said. All I can do is give you bare life. You will have to learn what happens to people who interfere with me. As he spoke, he seized me violently by the arm. The roof of the palace opened to make way for us, and we mounted up so high into the air that the earth looked like a little cloud. Then, as before, he came down with the swiftness of lightning, and we touched the ground on a mountain top. Then he stooped and gathered a handful of earth, and murmured some words over it, after which he threw the earth in my face, saying as he did so, Quit the form of a man, and assume that of a monkey. This done he vanished, and I was in the likeness of an ape, and in a country I had never seen before. However, there was no use in stopping where I was, so I came down the mountain and found myself in a flat plain which was bounded by the sea. I traveled towards it and was pleased to see a vessel moored about half a mile from shore. There were no waves, so I broke off the branch of a tree and, dragging it down to the water's edge, sat across it. While using two sticks for oars, I rowed myself towards the ship. The deck was full of people who watched my progress with interest. But when I seized a rope and swung myself on board, I found that I had only escaped death at the hands of the genie to perish by those of the sailors, lest I should bring ill luck to the vessel and the merchants. "'Throw him into the sea!' cried one. "'Knock him on the head with a hammer!' exclaimed another. "'Let me shoot him with an arrow!' said a third. And certainly somebody would have had his way if I had not flung myself at the captain's feet— and grasped tight hold of his dress. He appeared touched by my action and patted my head, and declared that he would take me under his protection, and that no one should do me any harm. At the end of about fifty days, we cast anchor before a large town, and the ship was immediately surrounded by a multitude of small boats filled with people, who had come either to meet their friends or from simple curiosity. Among others, one boat contained several officials who asked to see the merchants on board and informed them that they had been sent by the sultan in token of welcome, and to beg them each to write a few lines on a roll of paper. In order to explain this strange request, continued the officers, it is necessary that you should know that the Grand Vizier, lately dead, was celebrated for his beautiful handwriting and the sultan is anxious to find a similar talent in his successor. Hitherto the search has been a failure, but his highness has not yet given up hope. One after another the merchants set down a few lines upon the scroll, and when they had all finished I came forward, and snatched the paper from the man who held it. At first they all thought I was going to throw it into the sea, but they were quieted. When they saw, I held it with great care, and great was their surprise when I made signs that I, too, wished to write something. "'Let him do it if he wants to,' said the captain. "'If he only makes a mess of the paper, you may be sure I will punish him for it. But if, as I hope, he really can write, for he is the cleverest monkey I ever saw, I will adopt him as my son. The one I lost had not nearly so much sense.' No more was said, and I took the pen and wrote the six sorts of writing in use among the Arabs, and each sort contained an original verse or couplet in praise of the sultan. And not only did my handwriting completely eclipse that of the merchants, 
but it is hardly too much to say that none so beautiful had ever been seen in that country. When I had ended, the officials took the roll and returned to the sultan. As soon as the monarch saw my writing, he did not so much as look at the samples of the merchants, but desired his officials to take the finest and most richly caparisoned horses in his stables, together with the most magnificent dress they could procure, and put it on the person who had written those lines, and bring him to court. The officials began to laugh when they heard the sultan's command, but as soon as they could speak they said, "'Deign, your highness, to excuse our mirth. But those lines were not written by a man, but by a monkey.' "'A monkey!' exclaimed the sultan. "'Yes, sire,' answered the officials. "'They were written by a monkey in our presence.' "'Then bring me the monkey,' he replied, "'as fast as you can.' The sultan's officials returned to the ship and showed the royal order to the captain. "'He is the master,' said the good man, "'and desired that I should be sent for. "'Then they put on me the gorgeous robe "'and rowed me to land, "'where I was placed on the horse "'and led to the palace. "'Here the sultan was awaiting me in great state, "'surrounded by his court.' All the way along the streets I had been the object of curiosity to a vast crowd, which had filled every doorway and every window, and it was amidst their shouts and cheers that I was ushered into the presence of the sultan. I approached the throne on which he was seated and made him three low bows, then prostrated myself at his feet to the surprise of everyone who could not understand how it was possible that a monkey should be able to distinguish a sultan from other people, and to pay him the respect due his rank. However, accepting the usual speech, I omitted none of the common forms attending a royal audience. When it was over, the sultan dismissed all the court, keeping with him only the chief of the eunuchs and a little slave. He then passed into another room and ordered food to be brought making signs to me to sit at table with him and eat. I rose from my seat, kissed the ground, and took my place at the table, eating, as you may suppose, with care and in moderation. Before the dishes were removed, I made signs that writing materials, which stood in one corner of the room, should be laid in front of me. I then took a peach— and wrote on it some verses in praise of the sultan, who was speechless with astonishment. But when I did the same thing on a glass from which I had drunk, he murmured to himself, Why, a man who could do as much would be cleverer than any other man, and this is only a monkey. Supper being over, chessmen were brought, and the sultan signed to me to know if I would play with him. I kissed the ground and laid my hand on my head to show that I was ready to show myself worthy of the honor. He beat me the first game, but I won the second and third, and seeing that this did not quite please, I dashed off a verse by way of consolation. The sultan was so enchanted with all the talents of which I had given proof that he wished me to exhibit some of them to other people. So, turning to the chief of the eunuchs, he said, Go and beg my daughter, Queen of Beauty, to come here. I will show her something she has never seen before. The chief of the eunuchs bowed and left the room, ushering in a few moments later the princess, Queen of Beauty. Her face was uncovered, but the moment she set foot in the room, she threw her veil over her head. Sire, she said to her father, what can you be thinking of to summon me like this into the presence of a man? I do not understand you, replied the sultan. There's nobody here but the eunuch, who is your own servant, the little slave, and myself. Yet you cover yourself with your veil and reproach me for having sent for you, as if I had committed a crime. Sire, answered the princess, I am right and you are wrong. This monkey is really no monkey at all but a young prince who has been turned into a monkey by the wicked spells of a genie 
son of the daughter of Eblis. As will be imagined, these words took the sultan by surprise, and he looked at me to see how I should take the statement of the princess. As I was unable to speak, I placed my hand on my head to show that it was true. But how do you know this, my daughter? asked he. Sire, replied Queen of Beauty, the old lady who took care of me in my childhood was an accomplished magician, and she taught me seventy rules of her art, by means of which I could, in the twinkling of an eye, transplant your capital into the middle of the ocean. Her art likewise teaches me to recognize at first sight all persons who are enchanted, and tells me by whom the spell was wrought. My daughter, said the sultan, I really had no idea you were so clever. Sire, replied the princess, there are many out-of-the-way things it is well to know, but one should never boast of them. Well, asked the sultan, can you tell me what must be done to disenchant the young prince? Certainly, and I can do it. "'Then restore him to his former shape,' cried the sultan. "'You could give me no greater pleasure, "'for I wish to make him my grand vizier, "'and to give him to you for your husband.' "'As your highness pleases,' replied the princess. "'Queen of Beauty rose and went to her chamber, "'from which she fetched a knife "'with some Hebrew words engraved on the blade. "'She then desired the sultan, "'the chief of the eunuchs, the little slave, and myself,' to descend into a secret court of the palace, and placed us beneath a gallery which ran all around, she herself standing in the center of the court. Here she traced a large circle, and in it wrote several words in Arab characters. When the circle and the writing were finished, she stood in the middle of it and repeated some verses from the Koran. Slowly the air grew dark, and we felt as if the earth was about to crumble away, and our fright was by no means diminished at seeing the genie, son of the daughter of Eblis, suddenly appear under the form of a colossal lion. Dog! cried the princess when she first caught sight of him. You think to strike terror into me by daring to present yourself before me in this hideous shape. And you, retorted the lion, have not feared to break our treaty that engaged solemnly we should never interfere with each other. Accursed genie, exclaimed the princess, it is you by whom that treaty was first broken. I will teach you how to give me so much trouble, said the lion, and opening his huge mouth, he advanced to swallow her. But the princess expected something of the sort and was on her guard. She bounded on one side, and seizing one of the hairs of his mane, repeated two or three words over it. In an instant it became a sword, and with a sharp blow she cut the lion's body into two pieces. These pieces vanished no one knew where, and only the lion's head remained, which was at once changed into a scorpion. Quick as thought, the princess assumed the form of a serpent and gave battle to the scorpion who, finding he was getting the worst of it, turned himself into an eagle and took flight. But in a moment, the serpent had become an eagle more powerful still, who soared up in the air and after him, and then we lost sight of them both. We all remained where we were, quaking with anxiety, when the ground opened in front of us, and a black-and-white cat leapt out, its hair standing on end and meowing frightfully. At its heels was a wolf, who had almost seized it, when the cat changed itself into a worm, and, piercing the skin of a pomegranate, which had tumbled from a tree, hid itself in the fruit. The pomegranate swelled till it grew as large as a pumpkin, and raised itself on to the roof of the gallery, from which it fell into the court, and was broken into bits. While this was taking place... The wolf, who had transformed himself into a cock, began to swallow the seeds of the pomegranate as fast as he could. When all were gone, he flew towards us, flapping his wings as if to ask if we saw any more, when suddenly his eye fell on one, 
which lay on the bank of the little canal that flowed through the court. He hastened towards it, but before he could touch it, the seed rolled into the canal and became a fish. The cock flung himself in after the fish and took the shape of a pike, and for two hours they chased each other up and down under the water, uttering horrible cries, but we could see nothing. At length they rose from the water in their proper forms, but darting such flames of fire from their mouths that we dreaded lest the palace should catch fire. Soon, however, we had much greater cause for alarm, as the genie, having shaken off the princess, flew towards us. Our fate would have been sealed if the princess, seeing our danger, had not attracted the attention of the genie to herself. As it was, the sultan's beard was singed and his face scorched. The chief of the eunuchs was burned to a cinder, while a spark deprived me of the sight of one eye. Both I and the sultan had given up all hope of a rescue. When there was a shout of, Victory! Victory! from the princess, and the genie lay at her feet, a great heap of ashes. Exhausted though she was, the princess at once ordered the little slave, who alone was uninjured, to bring her a cup of water, which she took in her hand. First repeating some magic words over it, she dashed it into my face, saying, If you are only a monkey by enchantment, resume the form of the man you were before. In an instant I stood before her the same man I had formerly been, though having lost the sight of one eye. I was about to fall on my knees and thank the princess, but she did not give me time. Turning to the sultan, her father, she said, Sire, I have gained the battle, but it has cost me dear. The fire has penetrated to my heart, and I have only a few moments to live. This would not have happened if I had only noticed the last pomegranate seed and eaten it like the rest. It was the last struggle of the genie, and up to that time I was quite safe. But having let this chance slip, I was forced to resort to fire, and in spite of all his experience, I showed the genie that I knew more than he did. He is dead and in ashes, but my own death is approaching fast. My daughter, cried the sultan, how sad is my condition. I am only surprised I am alive at all. The eunuch is consumed by the flames, and the prince whom you have delivered has lost the sight of one eye. He could say no more, for sobs choked his voice, and we all wept together. Suddenly the princess shrieked, I burn! I burn! And death came to free her from her torments. I have no words, madam, to tell you of my feelings at this terrible sight. I would rather have remained a monkey all my life than let my benefactress perish in this shocking manner. As for the sultan, he was quite inconsolable, and his subjects, who had dearly loved the princess, shared his grief. For seven days the whole nation mourned, and then the ashes of the princess were buried with great pomp, and a superb tomb was raised over her. As soon as the sultan recovered from the severe illness which had seized him after the death of the princess, he sent for me and plainly, though politely, informed me that my presence would always remind him of his loss, and he begged that I would instantly quit his kingdom and on pain of death never return to it. I was, of course, bound to obey, and not knowing what was to become of me, I shaved my beard and eyebrows, and put on the dress of a dervish. After wandering aimlessly through several countries, I resolved to come to Baghdad, and request an audience of the commander of the faithful. And that, madam, is my story. The other dervish then told his story. The Story of the Third Dervish, Son of a King My story, said the third dervish, is quite different from those of my two friends. It was fate that deprived them of their sight, but mine was lost by my own folly. My name is Agib, 
and I am the son of a king, called Kasib, who reigned over a large kingdom, which had for its capital one of the finest seaport towns in the world. When I succeeded to my father's throne, my first care was to visit the provinces on the mainland, and then to sail to the numerous islands which lay off the shore, in order to gain the hearts of my subjects. These voyages gave me such a taste for sailing that I soon determined to explore more distant seas, and commanded a fleet of ships to be got ready without delay. When they were properly fitted out, I embarked on my expedition. For forty days wind and weather were all in our favor, but the next night a terrific storm arose, which blew us hither and thither for ten days, till the pilot confessed that he had quite lost his bearings. Accordingly, a sailor was sent up to the masthead to try to catch a sight of land, and reported that nothing was to be seen but the sea and sky, except a huge mass of blackness that lay astern. On hearing this, the pilot grew white, and, beating his breast, he cried, "'Oh, sir, we are lost, lost!' till the ship's crew trembled at they knew not what. When he had recovered himself a little, and was able to explain the cause of his terror, he replied, in answer to my question, that we had drifted far out of our course, and that the following day, about noon, we should come near that mass of darkness, which, said he, is nothing but the famous Black Mountain. This mountain is composed of adamant, which attracts to itself all the iron and nails in your ship, and as we are helplessly drawn nearer, the force of attraction will become so great that the iron and nails will fall out of the ships and cling to the mountain, and the ships will sink to the bottom with all that are in them. This it is that causes the side of the mountain towards the sea to appear of such a dense blackness. As may be supposed, continued the pilot, the mountain sides are very rugged, but on the summit stands a brass dome, supported on pillars, and bearing on top the figure of a brass horse with a rider on his back. This rider wears a breastplate of lead, on which strange signs and figures are engraved, and it is said that as long as this statue remains on the dome, vessels will never cease to perish at the foot of the mountain. So saying, the pilot began to weep afresh, and the crew, fearing their last hour had come, made their wills, each one in favor of his fellow. At noon the next day, as the pilot had foretold, we were so near to the Black Mountain that we saw all the nails and iron fly out of the ships and dash themselves against the mountain with a horrible noise. A moment after the vessels fell asunder and sank, the crews with them. I alone managed to grasp a floating plank, and was driven ashore by the wind without even a scratch. What was my joy on finding myself at the bottom of some steps, which led straight up the mountain, for there was not another inch to the right or the left where a man could set his foot. And indeed, even the steps themselves were so narrow and so steep that if the lightest breeze had arisen, I should certainly have been blown into the sea. When I reached the top, I found the brass dome and the statue exactly as the pilot had described, but was too wearied with all I had gone through to do more than glance at them, and flinging myself under the dome was asleep in an instant. In my dreams, an old man appeared to me and said, Hearken, Agib! As soon as thou art awake, dig up the ground underfoot, and thou shalt find a bow of brass and three arrows of lead. Shoot the arrows at the statue, and the rider shall tumble into the sea, but the horse will fall down by thy side, and thou shalt bury him in the place from which thou tookest the bow and arrows. This being done, the sea will rise and cover the mountain and on it thou wilt perceive the figure of a metal man seated in a boat, having an oar in each hand. Step on board, 
and let him conduct thee. But if thou wouldst behold thy kingdom again, see that thou takest not the name of Allah into thy mouth. Having uttered these words, the vision left me, and I awoke, much comforted. I sprang up and drew the bow and arrows out of the ground, and with a third shot the horseman fell with a great crash into the sea, which instantly began to rise so rapidly that I had hardly time to bury the horse before the boat approached me. I stepped silently in and sat down, and the metal man pushed off and rode without stopping for nine days, after which land appeared on the horizon. I was so overcome with joy at this sight that I forgot all the old man had told me and cried out, Allah be praised! Allah be praised! The words were scarcely out of my mouth when the boat and man sank from beneath me and left me floating on the surface. All that day and the next night I swam and floated alternately, making as well as I could for the land which was nearest to me. At last my strength began to fail, and I gave myself up for lost, when the wind suddenly rose and a huge wave cast me on a flat shore. Then, placing myself in safety, I hastily spread my clothes out to dry in the sun and flung myself on the warm ground to rest. Next morning I dressed myself and began to look about me. There seemed to be no one but myself on the island, which was covered with fruit trees and watered with streams, but seemed a long distance from the mainland which I hoped to reach. Before, however, I had time to feel cast down, I saw a ship making directly for the island, and not knowing whether it would contain friends or foes, I hid myself in the thick branches of a tree. The sailors ran the ship into a creek where ten slaves landed, carrying spades and pickaxes. In the middle of the island they stopped, and after digging some time, lifted up what seemed to be a trap door. Then they returned to the vessel two or three times for furniture and provisions, and finally were accompanied by an old man leading a handsome boy of fourteen or fifteen years of age. They all disappeared down the trap door, and after remaining below for a few minutes came up again, but without the boy, and let down the trap door, covering it with earth as before. This done, they entered the ship and set sail. As soon as they were out of sight, I came down from my tree and went to the place where the boy had been buried. I dug up the earth till I reached a large stone with a ring in the center. This, when removed, disclosed a flight of stone steps which led to a large room richly furnished and lighted by tapers. On a pile of cushions covered with tapestry sat the boy. He looked up startled and frightened at the sight of a stranger in such a place, and to soothe his fears I at once spoke, Be not alarmed, sir, whoever you may be. I am a king, and the son of a king, and will do you no hurt. On the contrary, perhaps I have been sent here to deliver you out of this tomb, where you have been buried alive. Hearing my words, the young man recovered himself, and when I had ended, he said, the reasons, prince, that have caused me to be buried in this place are so strange that they cannot but surprise you. My father is a rich merchant, owning much land and many ships, and has great dealings in precious stones. But he never ceased mourning that he had no children to inherit his wealth. At length, one day he dreamed that the following year a son would be born to him, and when this actually happened, he consulted all the wise men in the kingdom as to the future of the infant. One and all, they said the same thing. I was to live happily till I was fifteen, when a terrible danger awaited me, which I should hardly escape. If, however, I should succeed in doing so, I should live to a great old age. And, they added, when the statue of the brass horse on the top of the mountain of adamant is thrown into the sea by Agib, the son of Kasib, then beware. For fifty days later your son shall fall by his hand. 
This prophecy struck the heart of my father with such woe that he never got over it. But that did not prevent him from attending carefully to my education till I attained a short time ago my fifteenth birthday. It was only yesterday that the news reached him that ten days previously the statue of brass had been thrown into the sea, and he at once set about hiding me in this underground chamber, which was built for the purpose, promising to fetch me out when the forty days have passed. For myself I have no fears, as Prince Agib is not likely to come here to look for me. I listened to his story with an inward laugh as to the absurdity of my ever wishing to cause the death of this harmless boy, whom I hastened to assure of my friendship, and even of my protection, begging him in return to convey me in his father's ship to my own country. I need hardly say that I took special care not to inform him that I was the Agib whom he dreaded. The day passed in conversation on various subjects, and I found him a youth of ready wit and of some learning. I took on myself the duties of a servant, held the basin and water for him when he washed, prepared the dinner and set it on the table. He soon grew to love me, and for thirty-nine days we spent as pleasant an existence as could be expected underground. The morning of the fortieth dawned, and the young man, when he woke, gave thanks in an outburst of joy that the danger was past. "'My father may be here at any moment,' said he. "'So make me, I pray you, a bath of hot water that I may bathe and change my clothes and be ready to receive him.' So I fetched the water as he asked, and washed and rubbed him, after which he lay down again and slept a little. When he opened his eyes for the second time, he begged me to bring him a melon and some sugar, that he might eat and refresh himself. I soon chose a fine melon out of those which remained, but could find no knife to cut it with. Look in the cornice over my head, said he, and I think you will find one. It was so high above me that I had some difficulty in reaching it, and, catching my foot in the covering of the bed, I slipped and fell right upon the young man, the knife going straight into his heart. At this awful sight I shrieked aloud in my grief and pain. I threw myself on the ground and rent my clothes and tore my hair with sorrow. Then, fearing to be punished as his murderer by the unhappy father, I raised the great stone which blocked the staircase, and quitting the underground chamber, made everything as fast as before. Scarcely had I finished when, looking out to sea, I saw the vessel heading for the island, and feeling that it would be useless for me to protest my innocence, I again concealed myself among the branches of a tree that grew nearby. The old man and his slaves pushed off in a boat, and directly the ship touched land, and walked quickly towards the entrance to the underground chamber. But when they were near enough to see that the earth had been disturbed, they paused and changed color. In silence they all went down and called to the youth by name. Then for a moment I heard no more. Suddenly a fearful scream rent the air, and the next instant the slaves came up the steps, carrying with them the body of the old man who had fainted from sorrow. Laying him down at the foot of the tree in which I had taken shelter, they did their best to recover him, but it took a long while. When at last he revived, they left him to dig a grave, and then laying the young man's body in it, they threw in the earth. This ended, the slaves brought up all the furniture that remained below and put it on the vessel, and breaking some boughs to weave a litter, they laid the old man on it and carried him to the ship, which spread its sails and stood out to sea. So once more I was quite alone, and for a whole month I walked daily over the island, seeking for some chance to escape. At length, one day it struck me that my prison had grown much larger, and that the mainland seemed to be nearer. My heart beat at this thought, which was almost too good to be true. I watched a little longer. There was no doubt about it, 
and soon there was only a tiny stream for me to cross. Even when I was safe on the other side, I had a long distance to go on the mud and the sand before I reached dry ground, and very tired I was. When far in front of me I caught sight of a castle of red copper, which at first sight I took to be a fire. I made all the haste I could, and after some miles of hard walking stood before it, and gazed at it in astonishment, for it seemed to me the most wonderful building I had ever beheld. While I was still staring at it, there came towards me a tall old man, accompanied by ten young men, all handsome, and all blind of the right eye. Now in its way the spectacle of ten men walking together, all blind of the right eye, is as uncommon as that of a copper castle. And I was turning over in my mind what could be the meaning of this strange fact, when they greeted me warmly and inquired what had brought me there. I replied that my story was somewhat long, but if they would take the trouble to sit down, I should be happy to tell it them. When I had finished, the young men begged that I would go with them to the castle, and I joyfully accepted their offer. We passed through what seemed to me an endless number of rooms, and came at length into a large hall furnished with ten small blue sofas for the ten young men, which served as beds as well as chairs, and with another sofa in the middle for the old man. As none of the sofas could hold more than one person, they bade me place myself on the carpet and to ask no questions about anything I should see. After a little while the old man rose and brought in supper, which I ate heartily, for I was very hungry. Then one of the young men begged me to repeat my story, which had struck them all with astonishment, and when I had ended, the old man was bidden to do his duty as it was late, and they all wished to go to bed. At these words he rose, and went to a closet, from which he brought out ten basins, all covered with blue stuff. He set one before each of the young men, together with a lighted taper. When the covers were taken off the basins, I saw they were filled with ashes, coal dust, and lamp black. The young men mixed these all together, and smeared the whole over their heads and faces. Then they wept and beat their breasts, crying, This is the fruit of idleness and of our wicked lives. This ceremony lasted nearly the whole night, and when it stopped they washed themselves carefully and put on fresh clothes and lay down to sleep. All this while I had refrained from questions, though my curiosity almost seemed to burn a hole in me. But the following day when we went out to walk, I said to them, Gentlemen, I must disobey your wishes, for I can keep silence no more. You do not appear to lack wit, yet you do such actions as none but madmen could be capable of. Whatever befalls me, I cannot forbear asking. Why you daub your faces with black, and how it is you are all blind of one eye? But they answered that such questions were none of my business and that I should do well to hold my peace. During that day we spoke of other things, but when night came and the same ceremony was repeated, I implored them most earnestly to let me know the meaning of it all. It is for your own sake, replied one of the young men, that we have not granted your request, and to preserve you from our unfortunate fate. If, however, you wish to share our destiny, we will delay no longer. I answered that whatever might be the consequence, I wished to have my curiosity satisfied, and that I would take the result on my own head. He assured me that, even when I had lost my eye, I should be unable to remain with them, as their number was complete, and could not be added to. But to this I replied that, though I should be grieved to part company with such honest gentlemen, I would not be turned from my resolution on that account." On hearing my determination, my ten hosts then took a sheep and killed it, and handed me a knife, 
which they said I should by and by find useful. We must sew you into this sheepskin, said they, and then leave you. A fowl of monstrous size, called a rock, will appear in the air, taking you to be a sheep. He will snatch you up and carry you into the sky, but be not alarmed, for he will bring you safely down and lay you on top of a mountain. When you are on the ground, cut the skin with the knife and throw it off. As soon as the rock sees you, he will fly away from fear. But you must walk on till you come to a castle covered with plates of gold studded with jewels. Enter boldly at the gate, which always stands open. But do not ask us to tell you what we saw or befell us there, for that you will learn for yourself. This only we may say, that it cost us each our right eye, and has imposed upon us our nightly penance. After the young gentlemen had been at the trouble of sewing the sheepskin on me, they left me, and retired to the hall. In a few minutes the rock appeared, and bore me off to the top of the mountain in his huge claws, as lightly as if I had been a feather. For this great white bird is so strong that he has been known to carry even an elephant to his nest in the hills. The moment my feet touched the ground, I took out my knife and cut the threads that bound me, and the sight of me in my proper clothes so alarmed the rock that he spread his wings and flew away. Then I set out to seek the castle. I found it after wandering about for half a day, and never could I have imagined anything so glorious. The gate led into a square court, into which opened a hundred doors, ninety-nine of them being of rare woods, and one of gold. Through each of these doors I caught glimpses of splendid gardens, or of rich storehouses. Entering one of the doors, which was standing open, I found myself in a vast hall, where forty young ladies, magnificently dressed, and of perfect beauty, were reclining. As soon as they saw me, they rose and uttered words of welcome, and even forced me to take possession of a seat that was higher than their own, though my proper place was at their feet. Not content with this, one brought me splendid garments, while another filled a basin with scented water and poured it over my hands, and the rest busied themselves with preparing refreshments. After I had eaten and drunk of the most delicate food and rarest wines, the ladies crowded round me and begged me to tell them all my adventures. By the time I had finished, night had fallen, and the ladies lighted up the candle the castle with such a prodigious quantity of tapers that even day could hardly have been brighter. We then sat down to a supper of dried fruits and sweetmeats, after which some sang and others danced. I was so well amused that I did not notice how the time was passing. But at length one of the ladies approached and informed me it was midnight, and that, as I must be tired, she would conduct me to the room that had been prepared for me. Then, bidding me good night, I was left to sleep. I spent the next thirty-nine days in much the same way as the first, but at the close of that time the ladies appeared, as was their custom, in my room one morning to inquire how I had slept, and instead of looking cheerful and smiling, they were in floods of tears. Prince, said they, we must leave you and never was it so hard to part from any of our friends. Most likely we shall never see you again. But if you have sufficient self-command, perhaps we may yet look forward to a meeting. Ladies, I replied, what is the meaning of these strange words? I pray you tell me. No, then, answered one of them, that we are all princesses, each a king's daughter. We live in this castle together in the way that you have seen. But at the end of every year, secret duties call us away for the space of forty days. The time has now come. But before we depart, we will leave you our keys, so that you may not lack entertainment during our absence. 
but the one thing we would ask of you. The golden door alone forbear to open, as you value your own peace and the happiness of your life. That door once unlocked, we must bid you farewell forever. Weeping, I assured them of my prudence, and after embracing me tenderly, they went their ways. Every day I opened two or three fresh doors, each of which contained behind it so many curious things that I had no chance of feeling dull, much as I regretted the absence of the ladies. Sometimes it was an orchard whose fruit far exceeded in bigness any that grew in my father's garden. Sometimes it was a court planted with roses, jessamine, daffodils, hyacinths, and anemones, and a thousand other flowers of which I did not know the names. Or again, it would be an aviary, fitted with all kinds of singing birds, or a treasury heaped up with precious stones. But whatever I might see, all was perfect of its own sort. Thirty-nine days passed away more rapidly than I could have conceived possible, and the following morning the princesses were to return to the castle. But alas, I had explored every corner, save only the room that was shut in by the golden door, and I had no longer anything to amuse myself with. I stood before the forbidden place for some time, gazing at its beauty. Then... A happy inspiration struck me, that because I unlocked the door, it was not necessary that I should enter the chamber. It would be enough for me to stand outside and view whatever hidden wonders might be therein. Thus arguing against my own conscience, I turned the key, when a smell rushed out that, pleasant though it was, overcame me completely and I fell fainting across the threshold. Instead of being warned by this accident, directly I came to myself, I went for a few moments into the air to shake off the effects of the perfume, and then entered boldly. I found myself in a large vaulted room, lighted by tapers, scented with aloes and ambergris, standing in golden candlesticks, whilst gold and silver lamps hung from the ceiling. Though objects of rare workmanship lay heaped around me, I paid them scant attention, so much that I was struck by a great black horse which stood in one corner, the handsomest and best-shaped animal I had ever seen. His saddle and bridle were of massive gold, curiously wrought. One side of his trough was filled with clean barley and sesame, and the other with rose water. I led the animal into the open air, and then jumped on his back, shaking the reins as I did so. But as he never stirred, I touched him lightly with a switch I had picked up in his stable. No sooner did he feel the stroke than he spread his wings, which I had not perceived before, and flew up with me, straight into the sky. When he had reached a prodigious height, he next darted back to earth and alighted on the terrace belonging to a castle, shaking me violently out of the saddle as he did so, and giving me such a blow with his tail that he knocked out my right eye. Half stunned as I was with all that had happened to me, I rose to my feet thinking as I did so of what had befallen the ten young men, and watching the horse which was soaring into the clouds. I left the terrace, and wandered on till I came to a hall, which I knew to have been the one from which the rock had taken me by the ten blue sofas against the wall. The ten young men were not present when I first entered, but came in soon after, accompanied by the old man. They greeted me kindly, and bewailed my misfortune, though indeed they had expected nothing less. All that has happened to you, they said, we also have undergone, and we should be enjoying the same happiness still had we not opened the golden door while the princesses were absent. You have been no wiser than we, and have suffered the same punishment. 
we would gladly receive you among us to perform such penance as we do, but we have already told you that this is impossible. Depart, therefore, from hence, and go to the court of Baghdad, where you shall meet with him that can decide your destiny. They told me the way I was to travel, and I left them. On the road I caused my beard and eyebrows to be shaved, and put on a dervish's habit. I have had a long journey, but arrived this evening in the city, where I met my brother dervishes at the gate, being strangers like myself. We wondered much at one another, to see we were all blind of the same eye, but we had no leisure to discourse at length of our common calamities. We had only so much time as to come hither to implore those favors which you have been generously pleased to grant us. He finished, and it was Zobeda's turn to speak. Go wherever you please, she said, addressing all three. I pardon you all, but you must depart immediately out of this house. That was the story of the envious man and of him who was envied, and the story of the third dervish, son of a king, from the Arabian Nights Entertainments, selected and edited by Andrew Lang. Special thanks to Ginger Sands for our theme music. You can find more of Ginger's music at iTunes or on her website at www.gingersands.com. And if you'd like to comment on today's story, send me an email. I can be reached at susan.polter, that's P-O-U-L-T-E-R, at nashville.gov. Thanks for listening.